All right. Hey, happy Tuesday, May 1st again. Look at this, one o'clock, we're a few minutes late, but we had some prep work to do because this is a new weekly series launch, the Bitcoin Phenomenon, uh, Intro to Cryptocurrencies, and I'm with the very famous and talented Kazanomics, uh, which I tagged, and let us know you can hear us or see us. Michael St. Louis is on. Uh, we just wanna make sure you can hear us or see us. Give us, a, give, give us a thumbs up. I'm also gonna look at it on Facebook. I'm not exactly sure how this is gonna go. Uh, we're, Rhonda's on, just let us know you can hear us or see us. I'm loving the mask. We're gonna explain what that's all about. Probably we should. Gert <laughs> Garman's on. Uh, it looks good though. Hey, Michael says he can hear us or see us. So, um, I have been fascinated by, and we're, we're gonna let him, he can actually speak through that. Um, I can't. I, <laughs> we, thank you, Rhonda. So I've been fascinated by Bitcoin. I've had one guest on before, but I was looking for the right match because I really feel like I need the, whatever below the flashcard version is of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, I need to understand it at that level because it's very confusing to me and I think a lot of people. So my idea, I went to Kazanomics and I said, listen, I've got this idea for a show. Hey, Eileen, what if we dumb it down, you take your incredible gifts and talents and share them as much as you can with the world. I open an account and we kind of follow that through, but you give them some ideas of what's going on in the real world because there is an entirely crazy, insane, fun, exciting, I'll use those words, world <laughs> of cryptocurrency that Kazanomics is in and, um, you know, I thought it would be awesome for you guys to kind of touch into it because we hear so much about it on the news. So, welcome. How you guys doing? Thank How you guys. guys doing? So you can hear them, right? Thanks um, for so, thank you for, I mean, thank you for agreeing. All right, so let's get the, the elephant in the room or the stormtrooper in the room um, storm out of the way. Uh, why the mask? Uh, well... You know, I, I trade in cryptocurrency markets, and um, one of our core philosophies in my trading group is uh, understanding human perception. And one of the biggest components of human perception that affects people's ability to perceive true value is their biases. So, but you mean people have biases? People's biases affect their decision making, right? People don't really, in cryptographic markets, buy Bitcoin because of any fundamental reason. They buy it because of their belief of what they think they know of the fundamentals. Understood. So. so by their biases, they buy their beliefs. But you, like, so yeah, so you keep it, you, you, you do this. This isn't the first show, by the way. You can go to Kazanomics and look him up, and um, this is what he wears whenever he's posting about anything. So this is not just a get up for the show. This isn't just some kind of thing that we're throwing out there to attract <laughs> viewers. This is really how you present your show on a regular basis, where you're, right. where you're discussing cryptocurrency with people. Um, because of the perception market. Content matters, nothing else. Content matters, nothing else. So Shirley says I should get a mask too. I'm not really sure how to take that, Shirley. I think it was with love, um, but maybe mask I need bag. a mask. <laughs> I need something for next time. So what I love about it is you're also trying to sip a drink through that um, store. It off. You have pulled I it off. It. All right. I created an opening. I'm All right, so that. Bitcoin. Let's talk, can we just, so when I ask you these questions or when you share your story, I think it's so important for the people who are watching to really understand because we read about it. Um, people sometimes think that Bitcoin is still a real coin. It's not. There's physical representations of it, but that's not what the market's all about. So can you give us a little history from your perspective of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency? Um, and I might, you might need to speak louder because, you know, through that stormtrooper thing, I want to make sure people can hear you. Uh, Bitcoin itself hit the market like in, in 2009. It's a cryptographic currency is a digital store value that is verified by computers called miners. It's a way to transmit value without a third party, a way for me to basically peer to peer send you money. So kind of like a Venmo, right? Is that what it yeah. is? Or a pay, PayPal at the very basic level? Remember, you gotta dumb it down for me. So, But there's no third party. There's no intermediary in between. It's, so it's, it's just between the two of us. But the way that it's confirmed and that there, we secure the network that there's not fraud is that you have a number of computers on the network that are called miners that point all of their computing power or hashing power to solve cryptographic puzzles that the first computers that solve it earn a fee for confirming the transaction by solving these puzzles. So in this way, 
all of us, the, the citizens, the people, we secure the transactions and we confirm that there's no fraud and we allow the transmission of value from one person to another. So, and in this way, you know, there's a multitude of cryptographic currencies that have created ways to do this um, at you know, minimal cost compared to what is available today. So it's self-monitored, that's the point. We're right. not, we don't have the banking world, the crazy world, the uh, conspiracy theory world, the real world all involved. It's peer-to-peer, -peer, basically, it's and we're self- It's a decentralized market where the computing power is decentralized. There's no one specific person that controls it. It is a distributed you know, ledger that everybody's verifying with uh, the greatest amount of computing power possible. The market's difficulty to do that is uh, it's called difficulty. It adjusts dynamically with the amount of computing power that's aimed at the network. Why is um, the computing power important? Because that's where the self-monitoring comes in. That's what allows it to, you said it, um, it verifies it. Is that so what you said? I, it's called proof of work. Basically, the computer earn, uh, that can solve the puzzle will earn um, a fee a minor fee for the work completing of solving the puzzle that will verify the block that contains the transaction. That is what allows me to send uh, value from one party to another. So in this way, the distributed ledger, the, the computers that secure the network, uh, it's all of us. It's uh, computers all around the world. I mean, there's large farms that corner a great deal of the hashing power, but the idea was that there would be no one sole party that could control the network it would cost you too much to overwhelm the hashing power of all the collective computers, and this distributed network would basically um, operate decentralized and be you know, self-governing, that the market would not require a centralized regulatory body, and you would have a network like basically for the people and by the people of their own money. It also you know, has a finite supply. Um, oh yeah, the, talk about the finite supply, because I keep reading about that. And I've got a million questions, but I want you to, I really want you to go on your own. But the finite supply is interesting to me, because it feels like in our world, and pretty much the regular banking world, you can just keep printing money. Sound is down, Ted. You know, it's not the sound, we just have to get him um, get to, speak through the, okay. to speak through the beekeeper stormtrooper <laughs> um, thing. Thank you, Jameson. Um, but I feel like that people don't understand because they're so used to the government just printing more money. Uh, so if there's a shortage, you print more money, but that's not necessarily the case, when it, or it's well, not the case when it comes Bitcoin to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a deflationary asset because in a world where, you know, the money is a medium of exchange, it's not really an asset, right? It's fiat. You, you know, wealthy people don't hold money, they hold assets because as you print more money, the asset will reprice in terms of money. Um, Bitcoin, does not have the ability to create more Bitcoins. So it is a, is a deflationary asset simply because if in terms of the medium you're inflating, you don't get more of this, it's a limited asset, you'll reprice it in terms of the money. So Bitcoin will preserve value much like real estate does, um, but it does not pay you any kind of yield to hold it. Uh, so it is also made to kind of counteract what they see in the cryptographic world as you know, theft by inflation by printing away the value of your currency that you save. Um, there could be some misconceptions about really what's going on in the central banking world and what printing money really is, which is why people don't you know, understand why we can't seem to ever stop. But the rationale is that by creating a finite supply that it's, it's more honest money. That's kind of the belief behind that. So where did, the, where did the, the, give us a little history because I actually don't know. All of a sudden it came on to, and I wanna make sure this is as loud as possible. Hold on. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry guys. All of a sudden it came on to the scene. I started hearing about uh, Bitcoin especially first, right? Mm -hmm. So who came up with the idea? How did this begin? There has to be some sort of genesis for this. Um, so the, the person that the, uh, the creator of Bitcoin is a pseudonym uh, Satoshi Nakamoto for whomever this anonymous creator of Bitcoin may be. Whether an individual or uh, a, you know a team, um, that is the person that's created with the creation of Bitcoin is uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. So he has a pseudonym. Nobody knows who he is. Nobody knows who he is, which is which goes back to why you're in a mask and it's also a play on that that the Bitcoin is uh, is about anonymity. It's about you having control of your money, not being under surveillance, not being under watch, not having. You know, the, the, the powers that be have the ability to freeze your accounts. And so you're like, kind of you, off the grid in a funny kind of it's way. It's kind of like, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's money for the people, by the people, really. Like, what it's supposed to be, what it says on the money, like, you know, it's actually for the people and by it's the people. It's for the people. All right, Rhonda has a question, which is a great question. Oh, Sandra, you missed it. He's covered. Well, we'll go, I'll have you repeat that in a minute for people to join. <laughs> 
Um, Rhonda, who runs it or owns it? How do we know it's not a huge pyramid scheme, no disrespect meant? Because that's the perception. That's why I, when I right. talked to Kazanomics about this, I said, you're gonna really have to dumb it down and go as dumb. And that's not a reflection of you. This is a reflection of my knowledge or my lack of knowledge about it and people's perception of it. Because the first thing you think is, and that's a lot has to do with uh, ignorance because we don't know. And then a lot has to do with that people have taken it and made it almost like a network marketing, which is why she's saying a hu uh, pyramid scheme. So ha can you give us, who runs it, who owns it, and how do we know that it's safe, not a, a so pyramid it's scheme? It's not owned by anybody, it's not a business. You know, it's a, it's a protocol, and it's a code. And it's, it's, a code. it's pretty much something that's put into the market by a random creator. God forbid the random creator happens to exactly be the person you think you're getting free of, like a highly funded department, you know, in the government. But right. anyway, whoever had the capacity to, you know, fund and create what appears to be the perfect cryptographic code nine years ago, got it right, where so many people are struggling to get it right nine years later. Whoever it is, they were funded well enough to do it. It's in the marketplace. People have trust in it that it's something other than the, the banking system. And so, you know, take it on a life of its own. Um, so there's no ownership. As to the, the pyramid scheme, ask it. Um, you know, pyramid scheme works in that you're, you're trying to bring money into the system in order to basically be the last man holding the bag. And everyone makes money off of that. There's no real utility in the uh, product that they're selling you into. Um, but it Bitcoin must has have... utility. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Bitcoin... Explain utility. Explain the word utility. Because utility... you're talking about, remember, code and utility. Um, you're used to talking to people who actually understand some of these words. Yeah, take a sip. I love it. Mm -hmm. Under the Stormtrooper mask. Uh, but people don't understand what code has to do with it, what utility means. I mean, when I told you we're gonna have to flashcard it down, I'm saying that for me. I don't understand what that means. So the code has, the coding part has a lot to do with it. And then what, when you're using the word utility, how are you using it to? Okay, so let's like understand what value is, right? Why is something useful to you? It's because not everybody has it. And you know uh, that it has some kind of use, right? A screwdriver is useful because you may have a specific use case for it, so you need a screwdriver. Um, Bitcoin has a utility more than just getting people to buy into it so that you have a better price. It's the fact that it acts as a store of value. It is a deflationary asset, so it hedges against inflating currency. Um, it does allow you to transmit value. It does allow you to transmit it cheaper, and in most cases faster than many other means globally. Um, on top of that, Bitcoin has spawned an ecosystem with many other, you know, alternative coins that have uh, even crazier specific use cases, and even cases things like um, Ether and EOS, which are basically like iOS applications that, uh, you know, platforms you can put applications on. So there is actual utility. It's not just you buy into this coin because I'm going to make money off of you. There is uh, immense amounts of, you know, capital being thrown at developing all kinds of technologies and use cases in, in various spaces. Um, you know, social engineering, um, you know, bringing money into unbanked and emerging markets. There is a lot of use cases for cryptographic currencies. And it allows you to have, uh, you know, speed that was not accessible for without having banking intermediaries in the process. I love that. And I think that it's because, and we've got a couple of questions because I don't want to go on my little thing, but I want to ask, um, uh, repeat really quick for the people who've joined, why are you covered? We've got that question a lot. Why are you covered? Because, uh, you know, one of the things that's most interesting about crypto and many different markets I've seen um, is the way that people perceive value. And they generally do it with little to no understanding of the fundamentals of the thing that they judge. Um, so I believe in the message over the messenger. And so what I'm saying that. is useful. If you can't figure it out because I've got a mask on, you have a problem. <laughs> We're going to get deeper into that after the first show because there's a lot more to that, but he's being kind on the first show. We'll I'm talk being very about kind. it. I know you are. <laughs> All right, so um, somebody asked a question. You already asked why is he covered. Maxine said, Why do we hear that Bitcoin is easy to steal and lose? Um, so, recourse is an issue. You know, one of the things that would make adoption a lot easier um, is having vectors of trust that Bitcoin currently doesn't have. Um, Why doesn't have those? Because like in, in the way you hold Bitcoin, right? You can go through many places to get um, a digital wallet or a physical wallet and store Bitcoins. Um, there's lots of exchanges. People trade other alternative coins of crypto with. And security is everything. You know, Bitcoin's about security, having enough hashing power to secure the network so people can't, you know, double spend, basically spend Bitcoins twice. That's why the network uh, needs a certain amount of hashing power to be secure. 
Um, many of these exchanges have been hacked over the years, and if it happens, you know, you really don't have recourse. There's no one you can go after. There's no one you can pick up the phone and call 1-800 and say, where the fuck is my money, you know? Oh, um, oh we got our first F on the show. Very nice. I wasn't sure when that was going to happen. You don't have real people on this show. <laughs> anyway. Um, this is what we're going to deal with the, every week. I love it. <laughs> no, it's all right. The reality is, right, you know, if your grandmother wants to send, you know, her grandchild, like, you know, 15 grand for the semester in college, and it doesn't make it, and she can't call the, the you know call somebody to choke the life out of them to ask where my money's at. They're gonna have problems, right? And that's one of the, the main problems about real wide scale adoption is that like you know for mom and pop who is like at the base of the ladder and understanding blockchain technology and crypto, they don't need to know all the shit I know. They need to be able to grab the phone and say, hey, I have some money coming, and grab my right. iPhone. Here's an app. Here, at fifteen grand. Go check your app. See if it came. See if it's in your wallet. If they can do that and not worry about how it works. And when things don't go wrong, call somebody to help them out, figure it out. That's when Bitcoin is going to have adoption. You know, it's kind of like the internet in the late 90s. You know, finding information, you have to use Usenet and news groups. You have to be a little bit more savvy than the average in the computer world to actually make real good use of the information that was in the internet. Now today, Google and many other, you know, user interfaces have simplified it where grandma can go on there and, and get directions to, you know, go, go down to her local bank and sign up to buy some fucking scam coins from Charlie Lee. But either way... You know, what you want to look at is when the use case, when the utility gets to the point that the regular person can actually use it without knowing all of the little nuances. Bitcoin's in its infancy where you still have to know kind of like a little bit of the technical savvy of it to kind of like be in that world. Right. And the internet was like that at the late 90s. Today, you know, grabbing your iPhone, having the bandwidth we, we have get today. everything. You can look up anything. Right? right. The bandwidth is good enough moving around your iPhone now. You can stream videos moving. You don't think twice about what it was like to even see that, you know, in right. 2005 That's or six. It wasn't there. So Bitcoin's kind of like in that stage of its cycle. Um, you know, we had a really big pullback from 20,000. And when you look at it, Bitcoin mirrors really the internet in that era and that level of utility and understanding. There wasn't a wide amount of females in the internet market in 1999, and it wasn't really usable except for the geeks. Um, today, that's kind of what you see. I'm a geek. And I use it. <laughs> You're a geek? Is that what you are underneath that mask? All right, I've got a question for you about chains because you talked about that a few times. So we have a lot of names. We have Bitcoin. We have cryptocurrency. I still don't know what crypto means. You can give us the definition of that. You ha we have blockchains. Can you give us kind of the basics of what those mean and what the difference is? Oh, Tanette. Tanette, do not encourage him. Tanette says, two Fs, woohoo. It's just because she didn't say it on her show when she came on. <laughs> No, but um, give us, because I think people get confused. Is it Bitcoin? Bitcoin? Bitcoin is it cryptocurrency? Is, is, is it blockchain? Is it Ethereum? Nobody understands. I think the Ethereum's basic human being doesn't get it. Different coins um, attach to different, different chains, right? So Bitcoin itself records its transactions on a blockchain. That is the actual ledger that when I send you money and it, it reaches you, it's recorded as a transaction in the block that's found by miners by solving these cryptographic puzzles. Uh, so it is basically the, the public ledger that records the transactions verifiable and open to all to see. It's one of the, the things about Bitcoin that says we don't need a third party. We can verify and record our own tra transactions in a trusted manner between a distributed you know, ledger. Uh, and each party has to trust that, right? I mean, that's really that's what it boils down to. The thing about the computers that are working on the network is that if there's enough hashing power and the, and the hashing power is distributed, it's not cornered, you know, in more than 51% of the hashing power is not cornered by one single miner, then the, the, you can trust the transactions on the network. If it ever is cornered by more than that, if somebody had the capacity that actually put enough computing power to take over the network, they could technically spend multiple Bitcoins, the same coin, which is called double spend, which would be the fraud of it. Bitcoin would cost too much to overwhelm the network to do that. It right. would cost you too much to make it a benefit. So that's one of the reasons that like, you know, people say, is it unhackable? Technically, nothing's unhackable. But the that cost, is true. The cost to benefit ratio of trying to take over Bitcoin's network and beat the giant mining farms that secure it today would cost you more than what you could make, would make it like financially not you know, retarded. So Chris Rio says, confused. Uh, John Wilde, Daft Punk. Uh, and then somebody asked me if you were, Luke, you are my father. I love these Star Wars comments. It's good. Because people are engaged. What that means is we're all trying to figure it out. I'm trying to figure it out as we go. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So when you talk about the chain, though, is that a computer pro? Because you keep referring back to 
Um, you can't, we were talking about hacking and about computers and the chain. So is this an actual program? Remember, you gotta dumb it down for me. This is a program that somebody created and the program then helps generate the chain the, and the, then the chain creates, goes to the, the miner. We'll talk about miners in a the minute. The chain is, is the recording of the blocks that are the transactions themselves. Okay, the so the block the is block, a transaction. So every block holds X amount of data, which can contain X amount of transactions, okay. depending on which coin it is. And so when your miner solves a transaction, like some blocks, some transactions, some uh, coins have different block times. And then, you know, let's say a, a coin says that it has a, it generates a block every 10 minutes. There, there doesn't have to be the same amount of transactions in every block. You know, if there's a lot of transactions on the network, you may, you, uh, you can actually, you know, fill up, fill up a block if you don't have enough miners on the network. So you have um, the hashing power that's pointed to the network you know, will issue blocks that recorded the data on the network and will tell you how many transactions are in each block, which will confirm transactions are sent. So it is the distributed ledger itself of the computers that record the transactions of the network. And how does time. that make people, so let's say, so I put money into my account today. Mm -hmm. And this is what you're, so this is what you're seeing. This is what we're trying to figure out. No, it needs a lot of dumbing down. And, Kazanomics has been incredibly patient because he's still so he's still here, and I'm gonna we're, I'm gonna ask the questions where you're probably well, gonna want to strangle me because what happens is people don't even understand the thought process of a puzzle. You talked about a puzzle; they don't understand why the data in the block is important. Like the, the basic data in thing, the block is the transaction. It's me, the money I sent to you. Okay, so let's PM. say I put a thousand dollar. I decide. Listen, I've got money. I've got a thousand dollars. And I want to click on coin. What was the thing that we it, did? The app could say Bitcoin. Or... Bitcoin. And I want to put a thousand dollars in. What does that mean? How does that solve? A, how does somebody work on solving a puzzle? I think those are the things like okay. people don't understand. Like when I tell you to dumb it down. All right. So let's just say you open, you know, your first Coinbase, and you connect it to your bank account, and you want to buy like a thousand dollars of Bitcoin. Yes. So let's start there. Okay, once you get through the hurdles of how to do that and verify yourself and all that stuff and you connect it, you will purchase coin, like you would buy stock, you buy $1,000 of this coin trading on whatever it's trading now. I think it's trading at like 8,900. Right. Um, you buy this coin at 8,900, you buy $1,000 of it, you get whatever percentage of the coin you get, and you will have like point so-and-so BTC to then represent that dollar value of fiat. It is now moving around in the market. It is changing prices in terms of dollars. So Bitcoin, if it's at twenty thousand, you're you know let's just say it doubled. It went from like nine thousand to eighteen thousand. You would have two thousand U.S. dollars worth of Bitcoin. So now, if I want to take some of that money and send it to like my son or to his wallet, uh, when I send it, that's when you know it will enter. It will need to be confirmed on the network and recorded in a block. So if I send it to my son today at one twenty-five p.m. You know, and there's a block issued at like, you know, the next five minutes, my transaction should hopefully be in that block. And then it's going to be confirmed by miners on the network. And then it will be in my son's account when, or in his wallet, when it's confirmed. In, in, uh, in our case, it'd be six confirmations. So, so how does, so it sounds like it's very similar if you think about trading on the market it sounds like it's well, a little trades bit trades between people for a price in the market and it is just like currency like the forex market right it's a currency um, a medium of exchange for me to send a thousand us dollars to you i could buy a thousand dollars worth of euros and send you that or i could yes. buy a thousand dollars worth of bitcoin and send you that so it's just another medium of exchange i can buy so i think people are over um Overthinking it. Overthinking. You know, I'm overthinking it, so I'm part of the people. Because actually, when you just said that last thing, I'm like, okay, so it's kind of like a stock trade. It's like a Forex trade. It's, a, it's just, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's about, but what, what it's about to me. If you buy British it's a, pounds and hold those and send them to your grandma, you can buy Bitcoin and send that to your grandma. But the, tell us what the difference is between buying $1,000 worth of uh, Bitcoin versus a thousand dollars worth of forex or British pounds. It's fantastically more volatile than any market you've ever been in. So. <laughs> All right, so you love the volatility of it, but really, isn't the volatility from the fact that it's such an untapped or uncharted territory for people to be in? And so, people like Kazanomics has to. He's learned the territory. Is it like a separate currency? Great question, Rhonda. Is it like a separate currency? Because people are starting to take it. I've seen it as an option of paying bills or paying something. Right. 
Um, and so, yes, it kind of is. It's kind of like a, for lack of a better word, I hate to dumb it down, but PayPal. You're using a different venue never or platform? Ma- never compare Bitcoin to PayPal. Um, <laughs> I know I was going to get crap for that. Bitcoin is a medium <laughs> of transferring value. So if you wanted to pay your bills in U.S. dollars, you know, you could pick up the phone and use your Visa card and transfer X amount of U.S. dollars to pay your bills. If you're a power company that would accept Bitcoin, you could transfer the exact same dollar value of Bitcoin to them and have them receive that. So it's just a medium of transferring value like any other currency functions. It can function that way. It also though, also has a other use case as storing value because it's a deflationary asset at the same time. So in some ways it kind of acts like gold and acts like you know, a currency you can still use and pay bills with. But it. it is really volatile. So if you had to think, you know, your, your bill account could fluctuate in value 20% this week and you pretty much get screwed on your bills if it's not in your favor. So that's one of the issues is that it's so volatile to hold currency in there, I mean, and use it in the real world, you can't have the real value of your bill money fluctuating by 20% a week. Right. Um, so it is a more speculative market and I wouldn't tell you to think of it that that's the, the best use case. Um, converting into Bitcoin and using it at the point of sale, you know, then you won't, be, you won't suffer market risk. But it's definitely more of a speculative market this time that you'll see more people using it like to trade than anything than really look at it as a form of payment at this moment. There's other currencies that are you know, probably more stable and even faster that you know, work well as a form of payment and other ecosystems that are not decentralized and that use blockchain technology to you know, create networks that also work for payment, like Ripple, which is a centralized version of crypto that has caught on in parts of the world because you have recourse. You can do something if things go wrong. All right, Rhonda, so I agree with you. So until I had a very long conversation with uh, Kazanomics, I also thought, oh my God, this is risky. What would I do? So you're gonna follow me through my quote unquote investment or my time and we're gonna talk about it each week um, with Kazanomics because I wanna see what happens. It's, you know, you, you, Everything has a risk, so I would say no, it's not just for, for millennials, but I would say that you would think that the millennials would understand it more. So one of the reasons why, and Rhonda's a young person, but somebody like me, I just keep throwing it off. Like I don't wanna deal with it, I don't wanna hear about it, I don't understand it. I'm getting little bits and pieces now from our conversation, but I am being honest with you, I'm not walking away understanding 100% of what Casanomics said. So that's why we wanna have the show weekly and we wanna figure it out. We wanna kind of go through it together so we can uh, uh, try to anti-demonize it and make it so that people understand it because I believe there's a lot of value to it um, just from my own research on it. But Casanomics has been kind enough to get off of, he's a brilliant, cryptocurrency guy, I look him up, you're, he's saying no. Um, find him on Kazanomics, you can look it up, I tagged him. Uh, reach out to him if you have questions, I mean, and reach out and ask questions on the show. Um, but we're gonna do 30 minutes of this every week, one o'clock, uh, we're gonna track how I'm doing, we're gonna track the market, we're gonna ask more questions, because I have a million more questions just based on this 30, we've already done 30 minutes, by the way. Wow. 30, it goes fast. 30 it minute does. show, we're gonna, I'm gonna have a million other questions for him and so do you all. So ask me, reach out to him, message me, whatever you wanna do because I think it's so important to educate because I believe that this is where we're headed. This is such a great way of kind of taking the control back which is kind of what we're all in the mood for right now is kind of taking our control back. Um, so any parting words of wisdom for them, anything you wanna leave them with, um, they already have your contact information, well, basic. Um, they already have how to reach you on the show. Um, anything you want to leave them with? Because I opened, what is the account? I opened a Coinbase account. Coinbase is probably the easiest point of access for anybody in the United States. It had to be yeah. easy, right? Because it's me. You all know me. So. And that's the kind of like why Coinbase is designed the way it is. It's, it's to allow people that don't know all the crap we just talked about to be able to go and say, here's my money, give me some coins. Correct. And that's when you know the, the adoption is complete, is when you can pick up your iPhone and say, where do I go to get like an ice cream? And it tells you, and you can follow the map, and you have no idea how any of that worked. Um, Bitcoin's still, right. a long, still a long way off of that. But I can tell you, like, you know, as generations go, you'll notice that you know, when you were a kid, the things that you were okay with, your parents thought were ridiculous. And the things that your kids are gonna be okay with, 
you're going to find ridiculous. Yes, good um, perspective. That's so, true. You know, when you, you think about it, Back to the Future too. if anybody's not too uh, young to have seen that, there's a part where Michael J. Fox, you know, uh, goes into a throwback 80s um, diner and shoots the you know crap out of a bunch of stuff in a video game. And the kid looks at him and says, you really got to use your hands to play that? <laughs> and he's like, what the fuck, right? So it's like uh, the reality is your kids don't necessarily need to see the cash anymore because they were never conditioned to, to deal with that. Correct. So what they're going to be used to, you have to figure out before you really reflect your own age and can't adapt. Uh, the world is going always towards efficiency. And if we can move value um, globally at a lower cost faster, it opens up all kinds of doors economically. You know, um, my business is built completely on the fact that I'm allowed to do business with people all over the planet in every country in the world yeah, uh, because crypto enabled that. So again, when people call crypto or Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme, Bitcoin, you know, if you think about it, it's a platform that can facilitate um, businesses to, that could never have been before to actually come into being. Um, it will continue to get more efficient as time goes on. There's always going to be bad actors in every market. Um, when people say Bitcoin's used for like, you know, crimes like terrorism or drugs, as far as I know, Pablo Escobar and Brazil de Blanca had a billion dollars of US dollars. That is the main medium of exchange for most illegal activities in the entire world. So selecting the illegal activities like that that occur in Bitcoin and then branding the whole market with that is bullshit and dishonest at the best. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Tadette to be my um, counter of the swear words that we say on this show. I'm loving it. No, I, we're I literally, four, right? we're at four oh, or five. It's, it's awesome, man. It's no, it. no, no, they're totally fine. It's awesome. All right, so reach out to me. Reach out to Kazanomics. We're going to do this every week, and we have a lot more. We have so much to cover. I have so many more questions for you. Uh, thanks for dumbing it down. Thanks for agreeing to be on the show because you can see the response. People really do want to know, but they're afraid to go to somebody that... Uh, doesn't know what they're talking about because it, it seems like it's speculative. It seems like it's risky. It's something new. And it's if you something wait till new. Everybody and their mom thinks it's okay. You're the last motherfucker in the game. There it is. So we love you. We will see you next week at one o'clock. Mwah, Tonette. There you go. <laughs> <laughs>